I invite the panelists of the civic role session to come on stage and we'll start the first plenary session of the day. Possiamo ancora avere un bicchiere per favore che siamo in cinque. Grazie. Ok, welcome. This is the first uh, plenary session of the day and if you remember from our roadmap yesterday uh, yesterday we started with keynotes uh, on uh, the thematic tracks, uh, which is more specialized topics. So we discussed digital natives uh, with a keynote, uh, and today we continued in the breakout sessions. We discussed about the informational infrastructure, and uh, we discussed uh, of spatial infra infrastructure. And those were sort of vertical kind of teams uh, that are going to accompany us until tomorrow. But then, when we designed the conference, we wanted strongly to bring together these separate tracks and the obvious choice is uh, how do they serve the mission of university. So we had to define what those missions are and uh, today we're going to have three plenary sessions uh, about the three main uh, objectives of universities and therefore the spatial infrastructure or the informational infrastructures or our knowledge of digital natives are actually means to an end the information that we have to incorporate and to elaborate in order to understand how to serve the mission of university in the age of the internet. Now, we start uh, uh, perhaps not with the most obvious mission of universities and it's, it was a deliberate choice. Um, when in the past several months we were designing the conference, at some point we received from the two colleagues that are sitting uh, next to me, we received a, a very interesting message for us because it was uh, a message saying, what are universities for? Are they only, albeit crucially, there to teach students and to make do research or aren't there something else there? That was the beginning of the message that you sent uh, back in May. And, um, so that's exactly the objective of this first session. We're going to discuss in the afternoon about uh, universities as platform as for learning. We're going to discuss universities as knowledge creators and research. But we start with something different. Uh, the title, Civic Role of Universities. What do we mean by that? Well, first of all, let me introduce our panelists and then I will say just a few introductory remarks. Um, I have uh, to my left uh, uh, Martin Simons. Uh, Martin Simons is there and Jan Maschlein is, is right here. Thank you for coming from the Catholic University of Louvain. And uh, Colin McClay from the Berkman Center for Internet Society, thank you. And Marco Santambrogio from the University of Parma. Thank you. The introductory remarks uh, are uh, from, uh, as I speak as a, as a university professor, so not an expert on this specific topic, is just what I put down over, over these uh, few months thinking about the civic role of university and what that, that, that mean. And uh, I just put them on the table as a sort of starting point for our conversation. And um, I would start with uh, uh, the civic role of universities when we design a curricula, so we de decide what to teach students, that's uh, a first, perhaps, element uh, of uh, contributing to a uh, discourse uh, and part having a, a civic role. And uh, when we decide uh, the research topics, also again, in a, some indirect way, we are contributing to, uh, to society and to the public discussion. And incidentally, both <coughs> Uh, deci deciding what to teach and deciding what to research are two fundamental rights that are, for instance, enshrined in the Italian Constitution. That's one point. The second point uh, that came to my mind is that yesterday we heard Professor Rodotà underlining the importance of universities uh, uh, teaching critical thinking. Now, not, not just notions, but a critical approach to knowledge. And that also has a pretty obvious uh, civic component uh, uh, because uh, we are actually 
uh, when we do that as universities, we are trying to prepare critical citizens. But what uh, it, I find particularly interesting is to get, go up to this point are pretty much the normal functioning of universities, designing curricula, this, deciding what to do, the topics of research. But what about go, going a little further? Um, what about uh, individual professors engaging directly in the public sphere and discussing? Uh, they can do that, uh, of course, on their own specialized topic, and they can be interviewed by newspapers, they can write articles for newspapers, uh, and it's in general what is called, uh, at least in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, extramural speech. And so the questions become, is, is it this uh, something uh, recommended? Is something valuable for society? Is, is it, on the contrary, something that should be reprimanded because professors should only teach and do research? And going even a little further, is it okay if a university professor or a researcher in general speaks about something that is not specifically the sub-discipline of his specialization? Is it okay if he speaks about other subjects? And if so, under which rules? The American Association of Professors uh, uh, decades ago uh, developed some guidelines, some deontological guidelines saying what, in, what, in which cases this is appropriate. And uh, finally, what about uh, universities and institutions, not the individual professors that can, uh, it can rely upon his freedom of expression rights, uh, his intellectual freedom. What about universities as institutions? Do they have uh, at least potentially our role as institutions in uh, our deliberative democracies, and then think specifically of the fact that in a deliberative democracy, first uh, the decision makers and citizens should be informed. Can, you know, can we, do we want to think about the possibility of universities actually participating in the, in the process of informing, uh, particularly on complex problems or difficult problems informing before the deliberation takes place? And uh, how all these, uh, you see there is uh, many topics, and I'm sure our panelists will add some more. What about the internet with all this? Meaning that uh, we heard about the university, universities opening up their boundaries regarding scientific material, educational material. Professors can have their own blog. Universities in a much more um, diversified way could contribute to public discourse. So what about uh, uh, the role of the internet? Do they, does it offer new opportunities that go beyond what was available so far, go beyond the paper, news, the newspaper, go beyond television and radio? Okay, I will, I will stop here with my general remarks uh, and I will give the word uh, first to uh, Martin Simmons. Okay, uh, first, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Now, uh, the, the point I would like to make, together with my colleague, Jan Maskelin, is um, when addressing the, the issue of the civic wall of the university, um, there is a kind of common framing where uh, the university is approached in a very particular way, and we want to suggest a slightly different framing. Mm -hmm. So let me first say something about this common framing. It's a framing which you see, for instance, if you look at, in Europe, at the discourses on the civic role of the university, on the civic role of higher education in Europe. Point of departure is then that there are several challenges within society. There is something like a democratic deficit. The idea then is that a specific kind of civic competencies are required and that education, in a broad sense, has to take up its responsibility to learn these civic competencies. And of course, one of these institutions that has to take up that responsibility is the university. I think this is a kind of common framing that the university, among other learning environments, has to take up its responsibility mm -hmm. in order to promote uh, democratic participation, civic employability, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, we would like to reverse the question first, mm -hmm. it's a simple reversion. I think the question could be first, what does a university, as a university, has to offer to society or to Europe? And I think if you reframe the question in that way, um, I think one of the issues which is important at the university is 
not just its public role, but its public form. And the thesis we want to elaborate, or the statement we want to make, is that the public form of the university is related to its, what we call, its unique pedagogic form. The university, according to us, is not just a learning environment in view of transmission of research. It's not just a learning environment where there are individual learning trajectories, but there is a very specific public pedagogic form at stake. But I will give the floor now to Jan. He will elaborate this a bit more. Okay. So, so our, our idea is to, so to, to think about what is so special about the university. And so our, our thesis, our statement is it is its form, its unique pedagogical form. And we can take uh, the, or we want to take the public uh, lecturing uh, as the paradigmatic uh, um, uh, form of the, uh, of the university. And the, uh, the, public, the public lecturing, what is, a, what, what, what is so special about the public uh, uh, lecturing? Well, the public lecturing, uh, we think, is a, a particular way of gathering students around something and of making something into a public issue. And I want to, uh, if, if I may, I want to, to, to elaborate a little bit uh, on this uh, idea. So we said the, 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 the public lecturing is not to be seen as a learning environment, and it is not gathering a community of individual learners. But it was, and uh, maybe I can recall the, 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 the origin of the, uh, of the university, the university started with the declaration of we are not learners, we are not pupils, but we are or not disciples, but we are students. We are students. And uh, so the, 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 position, the position of the student hmm, is a special, I think, a special, uh, a special position, as is also the position of the, the, other, uh, um, the other one who is present in the public lecturing, huh? the professor. I think both, or we, we, we want to say that both, so the student and the professor, are public figures. It are the learners turned into students and the academics turned into professors. Professors who make things uh, public. Making things public is not just the same as making them known. If it would be about making them known, certainly today that would be very, very easy in many other ways. And the internet is, of course, exactly that, uh, offers that possibility to a great extent. If it would be only about informing or getting uh, uh, knowledge uh, spread, but it is not about making known, it is about making public. And making public means, in a certain way, to offer something. It can be a text, but it can also be a virus, a river, whatever. Making something into, making, you could say, some object into a thing that is something which provokes thinking. And which provokes a certain kind of public thinking. And what a professor is doing, uh, as he, when he is acting as a professor in a public lecture, is precisely this public thinking. So it means that the act of public lecturing, and I, I recall that uh, the, the, the originating act of the, of the university is the, is the lexio. It is the lexio, it is, the, it is it more, more even, it is the collexio, it is the, the collegium, at reading together, reading together of a text, a text which is disconnected from the sacred use that it had in the monasteries and uh, in the cloisters where it was uh, uh, locked up, so to say. The text is exposed, is exposed to a public, or you could say is profanated uh, in, a certain, in a certain way or deprivatized. So the, the, the first act of the university is this making a text public, to offer it for public to offer it uh, for public uh, thinking and to set it uh, to set it free. So, 
our idea is that exact, exactly this public lecturing offers us the paradigm of the university. Mm -hmm. And so we could think about, because also today already, and, and we apologize that we were not uh, there or could not be there uh, yesterday, but um, today already I, I heard a lot about this notion of learning environment. And you, you, you have a kind of, um, um, let's say, movement where we say the university must be reorganized as a kind of open learning environment. But our question is what makes a learning environment into a university? What makes it a university? And for us, this, this, this element of university has precisely to do with this making something into a public issue turning individual learners into students, that means people who are exposing themselves to a thing that is brought in the middle, that is put on the table, so to say, by the, uh, uh, by the uh, professor. And this implies also on the side of the professor and on the side of the student a certain, what you could call a certain ethos, a certain attitude. The professor is not a teacher. It's not, it's not somebody who is trying to teach something, but is someone who is exposing his thinking. Who is exposing his thinking. That's also the origin of the notion profess, uh, of the professor is to make public. It's to make public uh, his, uh, uh, his or her uh, thinking. That means that the attitude of the professor when he is professing and of the student when he is a student or she is a student, that this attitude is one is an experimental attitude. It is an attitude where, where we are ready to expose ourselves and to expose our thinking in the presence of a thing, a text, a virus, a, a river, a, a, as I said. Um, so that is, yeah, our, more or less what we try to, or what we'd like to try to bring in is this idea of a specific form of the university. And you could use this then as a kind of touchstone. You could say, okay, let's now look at the, at, at, uh, at, uh, uh, um, the internet. Mm -hmm. What would the, in how, how does the internet challenge this for? Or what could it bring or how could it? And, and we had uh, in, the, in the meeting this, in the meeting, uh, this morning, uh, where I assisted, the, 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 the session I assisted, there was this question about the lecture hall, for example. Mm -hmm. So how, how to make, to make things public, how to, to make, so make things public means not only to offer them to a public, but to gather a public, to make people concerned about a common thing which is on the table. That, that would be, but I will stop because I do Thank you. Colin or Marco, which one do you want to? Thank you. Um, I think I'll say something about two of the topics uh, that have been mentioned before, namely the problem of the curricula and the problem and critical thinking. Um, <clears throat> but I want to approach this from a particular point of view that is the point of view of academic freedom, which is a large topic. Um, lots of things have been written and the history of the university is full of interesting uh, ideas and problems that crop up. So what, what is academic freedom, first of all? It's not just uh, the uh, freedom of speech of individual professors. That, of course, would, is, is an individual right we all have in a democracy. It is something uh, a little more subtle. Uh, it's, it, the, the, it's not... The, the, Academic freedom is justified on the basis of the mission and social utility of uh, the university and the fact that so much depends nowadays, uh, even more than uh, before, on the production of knowledge, especially in a knowledge-based society, uh, economic uh, enjoying this freedom in the university is especially important. Now, um, the declaration uh, of principles on academic freedom and academic tenure, which was uh, 
which goes back to 1915, uh, identifies a problem which is very interesting, I think, and very difficult to manage. Um, in a democracy, all institutions of higher education, I quote from the uh, 1915 declaration, uh, in a democracy, all institutions of higher education must ultimately depend on popular support, um, yet faculty cannot pursue new knowledge or instill independence of mind if they are bound by the pieties of public opinion. In other words, there is a fundamental distinction between holding faculty accountable to professional norms and holding them accountable to public opinion. Two entirely different things. Now, uh, what's going to happen in the near future? Will the university in cyberspace be uh, subject to more pressure from public opinion or less? It seems to me that uh, the answer must be more pressure. Uh, I can see uh, especially two issues. First of all, there will be more students, or not, not just more students, but more people who will become, um, without being full-time or even part-time students, who will benefit from the services uh, afforded by the university. For instance, uh, university libraries, uh, courses, conferences, uh, uh, all sorts of interesting things which will be directly accessible. Uh, that means that, uh, well, this is not, it's unlikely that it will be all free. There will be uh, some price to pay, and so the university will be in touch with a much larger part of the society than it now is. And the funding of the university will depend not just on the students or on the uh, public funding, but uh, will depend on all those people who will uh, directly or indirectly access uh, the services pr provided by the university. And then uh, it will be uh, easy, I think, to uh, put the university under some pressure uh, now, what I have in mind are uh, examples of, uh, you know, threats to uh, freedom, to academic freedom, uh, such as, for instance, the boycott that has been suggested and to some extent put to, uh, into effect of uh, academics uh, coming from Israel. That was a very uh, alarming issue. That is a very alarming issue. And it seems to me that uh, we should think hard about that and whether in the near future there will be more or less, uh, there will be more threats like that or not. Um, now, this is just an example. I think there are, there are lots of uh, other similar issues. And uh, the, the, to repeat, the main, the two problems I see is that the university will more depend more and more on instead of uh, from financing from the government or uh, like in the United States from donors who are uh, directly uh, so to speak uh, who have a, um, a direct connection with the uh, institution they're funding uh, the finan financial dependence will be you know less in control of the academia itself it will be, uh, it can be more risky. And then the fact that uh, many people will uh, benefit from, without being students, without being part, uh, without feeling part of the institution or the university, uh, they will benefit but also be uh, a source of income for the university itself. Okay, so that was, uh, I'm sorry, I think it was I'll be short on the second issue. The second issue is the curricula. Um, a process is underway uh, in Europe, all over Europe, uh, to unify, to, to find some general uh, uniformity, in, which is a wonderful thing, of course. We all, uh, uh, the freedom 
uh, our students have to move around in Europe in different universities is wonderful. Uh, and yet, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, I see things as they are from Italy, from this particular point of view. It seems to me that this has generated a huge bureaucracy, uh, a kind of control, uh, because the idea, as far as I understand, no, nobody said it very clearly, I must say, but uh, the idea is that uh, the uh, ministry, the state, has to exercise some control in order to uh, make sure that there is, in fact, some uniformity, that the students can move around freely and so on. Now, I wonder whether this is at all necessary, and I don't think it is. As a matter of fact, uh, I mean, the Italian uh, case might be uh, you know, exceptional in some ways, because, um, you see, the, the, the ministry seems to have the power to, uh, to tell us, to tell faculty what to teach and to say something about the curricula themselves. Now, this is something that never happened. In the Middle Ages, the uh, faculty was completely free. I mean, the, the uh, internal matters were com left completely to uh, faculty, and you know, individual professors or uh, several. Um, it is not so nowadays, and it seems to me that we should find a way of having this freedom uh, for our students and for faculty to move around in different university systems in different in all over Europe without being um, uh, without being you know, w without creating this bureaucratic control and without creating a bureaucracy now that means that we have to find some way of comparing different degrees different institutions uh, that may, and it might be more difficult without a bureaucracy, but this is something we, we all have to learn how to do. There will be uh, uh, lots of things will be needed to allow students to compare different institutions, the quality of the teaching and so on, um, in, a, in a free way, but also in an effective way. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I fear that I'm going to uh, uh, bring the lofty level of this conversation uh, down a little, um, but perhaps that's my role. Um, uh, working at the Berkman Center, where I'm not faculty, um, but am uh, actively engaged in, a, in all the university activities from research to teaching uh, to engagement, um, I see these, um, these elements of the mission as inextricably linked. Now, I recognize that this is uh, these the, to to uh, create, disseminate, and apply knowledge, um, which is a typical university mission. Although I should note that Harvard University doesn't actually have a mission statement, but uh, in most other universities, most other university research uh, research universities, that is the mission statement. And these these activities go together in, I think, a, a unique and important way, in that they do form a cycle. Um, not just in, in ensuring that, that, that the knowledge that we create and share through teaching and publications um, uh, uh, stops there, but in fact that it reaches society, is applied, and then ideally returns back to the academy where that process can continue and begin anew, and that that knowledge be, uh, is built upon, is continually refined, and then um, reapplied. Um, so I think that paying inadequate attention to um, the, the civic role of the university to apply knowledge is, is, uh, does us a disservice. And, and I would argue, picking up on Alma uh, Swan's uh, comments yesterday, that I think that we, many universities, are a bit wayward in this civic role, um, that the incentive structures, the reward systems, the support for this sort of engagement uh, isn't there, uh, isn't always there where it should be. Um, I wonder also about um, uh, Stuart Schiebert's uh, uh, observations around faculty curiosity, laziness, and vanity, and, and how we might also, um, in the faculty and the rest of the university community, also um, cultivate a desire for impact, um, which would seem to also play into at least the vanity uh, and perhaps the curiosity, although unlikely the laziness. Um, 
that we might cultivate this uh, and reward this behavior and support this behavior um, institutionally and individually. Um, I think that uh, ICTs and the internet specifically, but every, all the characteristics of it, um, present us a unique uh, opportunity uh, or perhaps um, are a catalyst for change. Um, and I think about this um, both from my experience at the Berkman Center uh, as well as my experience in working in developing countries at the intersections of ICT and development um, where I um, became particularly interested in the role of university um, in the developing world context. And this is of course lumping 80% of the world uh, together, so it's an inartful term. Um, what we see is typically uh, institutions which are weaker, very limited resources, um, a huge uh, gaps between the different social sectors. So business is not talking to government, is not talking to the academy, is not talking to nonprofit organizations, and a whole host of of uh, barriers, gaps, and deficits. Um, so in this zone of scarce resources. Uh, uh, the university, in my view, and in some um, instances, has proven, uh, uh, and I believe could prove to be um, a, a terrifically rich resource. And I think that, although that, that case may be extreme as compared to Europe or the United States, it's not actually um, so different. Um, I think that the university's uh, unique attributes um, really do, um, when, in, when engaged with society, play uh, a particularly um, useful role. And I think that if we look at ICTs particularly, um, that we see some indications of these. So if we think about um, uh, information and communication technology and internet and society issues, we, it's explicitly multi-sectoral. It's multidisciplinary. Um, there are values such as experimentation. These are things that universities um, can play a unique role in socially and that in fact need, uh, need this provocation to remind themselves that the disciplines are valuable but also is useful to have multidisciplinary work. That it is important to reach out to other sectors, that they can use their convening power, as we heard yesterday from Jeff uh, via Charlie or Charlie via Jeff, um, that they have this unique capacity to bring uh, different groups together who don't normally talk to each other to solve problems. Um, I think the values of the internet are also um, uh, relevant here as we think about the values we heard of yesterday of openness, of collaboration, of sharing, both within the academy and more broadly in society. Uh, and oftentimes we focus on the, what technology allows us to do, but my sense of the, the most profound uh, learnings from the internet are not so much about what we can do using the technology, but the attitudes that we get from it of the value of sharing, of the value of collaboration, of the value of openness. And I think that by conveying these values more broadly uh, socially, um, both through its teaching and uh, research and its students, but also through how the university applies them and engages with society, um, we can, it can do us all a great service. Um, I'd also note that just at a functional level, uh, use of technology uh, through universities um, is uh, provokes a series of uh, activities and learnings and challenges. I mean, to use it effectively, the university ultimately becomes engaged in how technology works, which requires experimentation, which requires understanding of standards and lock-in and all sorts of other things, which then uh, po policy-related things and technology-related things, and social things, which then can be, uh, the university can engage on them in, uh, in an effort to advance the public interest. The, these are places where oftentimes the public is not well represented, and the university then, as uh, Charlie Nesson has ar uh, often argued, can be uh, a unique um, advocate on behalf of the public interest because it values education, because it values openness, because it values experimentation, and some of these other things that all of us care about that are essential um, to uh, a rich, robust, and productive um, internet. Um, so. This is sort of my, um, my optimistic take. Um, I recognize that there are lots of um, challenges to engagement, and we heard some um, from the financial challenges of how to, uh, to, to be able to uh, take money to do work that is relevant, but recognizing that um, the interests uh, at, at hand may influence um, who gives money and, and could represent a threat to academic freedom, could represent a, a threat to um, a perceived impartiality, which is so essential to the university. Um, that said, I think there are ways to deal with these. 
um, I think that that would be a rich zone for discussion about just how, where does that um, uh, 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 relationship between uh, basic research and applied research, um, uh, uh, what does that look like? How do we um, position ourselves in this 21st century to be able to do not just the basic but the applied research in a way that it is relevant to society, that it is guided not by popular opinion only but informed by what's happening in the world, that we are in some sense, uh, a long-term sense, I think, accountable but not um, uh, uh, and responsive to the, the needs of our communities but not overly so. Um, and, and not in a knee-jerk way and not, in a, and not influenced by finance, but rather by the learning that we do. So I think there are, there are um, great challenges uh, in that zone, but there are also great and simple opportunities. I think this, the idea of the university as a platform for learning, for innovation, for convening, for standards holding, for so many things that the university can uniquely do um, that don't uh, 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 implicate so many of those concerns. Um, that are the low-hanging fruit of the technology space, um, uh, I think are, are really uh, important contributions. So um, as we um, move forward in, in this conversation, what I would love to do is think about how do we um, actually provoke the sort of uh, change that we'd like to see vis-a-vis -vis the university's civic role and encourage that um, application of knowledge uh, in a way that's realistic and productive and doesn't undermine the most important values of the university and its independence and its experimentation and creativity and its role in society because those core values, those academic values of critical thought and so forth are essential to being able to perform this civic role. So it's somehow, how do you play in that space, um, to speak about gaming, how do you play in that space productively without um, undermining your ability to play in that space? Listening to, to all of you, it, it strikes me uh, that uh, during the conference so far, and even during this um, conversation, um, we have been talking a lot about how universities are opening up to society, in large part thanks to technology, our research products, our educational material, uh, through blogs and so on, we can reach out, so the, the walls came down, are coming down and also vice versa. Marco was saying many more people than just the actual students will be able to access the university. So there is a, a, a strong expansion and compenetration. At the same time, Jan and Martin uh, it brought us back to the fundamental act of uh, a professor professing and uh, students being actually students and exposing themselves. It's almost uh, almost in your representation was almost the theatrical, even though you say it's not a performance. It's not a performance, but we can almost, almost see them in a physical space uh, from the 12th century forward. And so it's almost, uh, if you went back to what was essential about university, and you underline the public aspect of that essential act of professing and being a student. Uh, so I'll, how to combine the, the two aspects, the walls coming down and reaching out to potentially everyone. And uh, we, can we say that everyone can become a student? No, because you remind us what is being a student. Um, so probably are we perhaps going into a direction where there are going to be a, a, a number of universities, a number of circles. There will be like an inner circle um, with physical spaces that uh, uh, enable, as we discussed today, uh, students, uh, their students in the sense that you described, but also have a, a virtual dimension. They are also in cyberspace at the same time, without diluting the experience uh, of reacting to what's on the table, as you, as you say. And we discussed this morning about the physical space that could allow that. But then you have an outer circle of people that maybe are watching this happening, so they're like spectators. So yet they are not students in the sense that you mentioned, but still they can benefit from the discussion, participate in the discussion. And people who do it uh, uh, not in, in real time, but maybe they watch on their screen in a second moment of this experience. And, uh, so different level of expectations. The inner circle where you actually have the 
professor and the students uh, and outer circles that have diminishing degrees of expectations but probably that uh, even though it's a diluted experience is still probably valuable uh, because we are not replacing the inner experience uh, the actual professor and student do, I, do, do you think it's feasible do you think it's uh, how do you think about it Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know whether you have to make a distinction between the inner and the outer circle. I mean, I think I agree that the walls are coming down in the sense that the university is opening up the society, especially in a knowledge-based society, knowledge-based economy. Uh, but I think uh, the, the one issue is I think the university has more to offer to society than just knowledge. And, mm -hmm books, so to speak, or texts and, and things like that. I think one of the issues is exactly that part of the university is also to make knowledge in a very particular way public. And I think that's where we introduce the word exposure and things like that. I think, and therefore we also use the public lecturing as a paradigm, we don't want to say that we have to go back to public lecturing and get rid of all electronic virtual learning environments. That's not what we are arguing. Mm -hmm. But our argument is perhaps what the university can offer to society is to try to give shape to, for instance, virtual learning environments in such a way that the learners are addressed there as students, that they mm -hmm. are not just getting knowledge, but are exposed to things of public interest. Mm -hmm. And I think there is one role of the university. So we are not, I think, the issue is not whether it's physical or virtual. Yeah. Uh, but how, for instance, in virtual learning environments, how to make a kind of university out of it? What would that be? What would the university offer them? And I think one of the issues there is that, and it's also referred to here, one of the perhaps unique features of the university is also its experimental ethos. That mm -hmm. the kind of, we are not just producing knowledge and transmitting knowledge, but also exp try to experiment, try to put things into question, put things back into perspective. And I think experimental ethos, not just in the sciences, but also in the social sciences and in the humanities. So experimental in the broad sense. If I just, just uh, a short thing to, to, that I want to add is that there is this, what I, what I heard also uh, from you, but maybe I misunderstood uh, on, at the end, you said uh, we have to, uh, to care for impact and then the desire uh, for impact and to make it productive. But maybe precisely the thing of the university, so you could say to, to the act of making something productive and there is indeed a, a very strong discourse today to make things productive. This is precisely a discourse which is very mobilizing. And I think everybody who is working now at the university has this feeling of being constantly mobilized, of, being, of, of having to, to do constantly, to, to, to look and to care for one's own position in, uh, in the field of the, of the university, its own university and, uh, and broader away. That's a mobilizing, that's mobilizing. But maybe one thing of the university is precisely that it interrupts this mobilizing thing that that what what is happening is in, 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 in the university and again the public lecture so not as the only place just as a paradigm public lecture is maybe again a, a good example of it, it is a kind when it works when it works because it often does not work but when it works it is like a kind of hole in time it is like a kind of interruption in time it brings us out of time out of time in the sense of out of the common time, of the regular time, and it brings us with the things. It gets us to the, to, to the things. And it is in a certain way rather slowing down than mobilizing. It is slowing down, not, not mobilizing. So there is the, 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 the call to be productive, I think is often, that, that is what we hear a lot. But, but yeah, education, education is not a production process. I think also research is not a production process. You can look at it like that, but the, the, yeah. 
the point of the university right, is precisely to, to, to take things out of their usual context or texts or whatever, to take persons, students, or learners, and academics out of their usual business and to make them into public figures. That is, in a certain way, to bring them in a space-time, which is a space-time where the regular, the common use, for example, of words or of things, is suspended. It's a kind of, it's a kind of place of suspension. And uh, so I, I would also uh, say that this is not a kind of, uh, the, our idea is indeed not that uh, internet would not be, uh, that, that there is no, no place there for internet, but the question is how? Mm -hmm. How, how to keep this element of the university in this kind of space. And what I hear a lot and read a lot is in fact another movement is saying the university is a learning, is a learning environment like any other learning environment. But what is the difference between wiki space or wiki, yeah, Wikipedia and, 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 and university? Is it, is it, uni, is it university? Maybe it, maybe it functions as university. Maybe it is, it can. But we should ask the question and not use this word learning environment in a very, very yeah, broad and undifferentiated uh, sense. But the, this slow in time, <coughs> so this low in time that you, and the, this new time space that you uh, evoke, uh, how does it cope with the div constant divided attention that we heard yesterday about digital natives being one of the typical features of digital natives doing multitasking simultaneously? Uh, so isn't there a strong, uh, a challenge, I mean. No, no, I, I, I agree totally that there is a very strong, a very strong challenge. And maybe I can recall what I, what I more and more find a very, a very challenging uh, thesis. That is a thesis which has been developed by Ivan Illich. And Ivan, <coughs> Ivan Illich uh, makes clear in a historical study how the invention of the university is directly related to the invention of the book text. Mm -hmm. So not of the text, but of the book text. That means a text which you can not only hear or sing, but a text which you can read. That had to do with a, with a typo typography, an ordering uh, of, the, of the text, and so on. And so the, 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 the invention of the university has to do with the invention of a readable text. That means also a text which can become public, which can be offered to others and we can, which can be on the knees of the students and they can read together with the professor the same, uh, uh, the same text. And he says in, in, at one point in, in, a, in a text out of, the, uh, out of the end of the 70s or beginning of the 80s, he, make a he makes a strong, uh, a strong thesis but he does not, he had not the time to develop it, but he makes the, uh, the strong thesis that maybe the digital age which transforms the book texts in a screen text also involves the end of the university. So it is like a kind of hypothesis. It, it, it does not develop it. But I think, the, and I think you mentioned it in the session this morning where I assisted also, you mentioned it, I think indeed, so uh, the screen which is over, over here, what does this mean? Uh, for this kind of uh, yeah. university form, uh, what what kind of challenge? I, I don't have yet a response, but I think there is a there is a huge challenge there. Uh. So could I? Uh, sure. I just, just wanted to respond briefly um, to the to the, your point on productive and mobilization, and uh, so I, I think uh, it's an excellent point, um, and I was definitely not advocating for one or the other. I mean, I think we all. Um, can agree that the, your description of uh, being transported in a lecture in that sense is completely magical and that's one of the things that we expect. We don't always achieve, but we expect to get from university and one of the highest, that sort of reflection and removal from your everyday cares to, to that particular place is uh, one of the goals of university and the educational process and something that's unique to that setting. Um, I think that um, being the, we're not very good with nuance, right? I mean, arguing for uh, embracing a civic role in the way that I did 
doesn't suggest that, that the university should turn its mind to being productive uh, completely um, and turning away from the sort of, um, uh, sort of a mental and temporal space that you described, but rather I think you need to do both. And I think that one of the things that's, that I feel so fortunate um, in, in my job to be able to do is some amount of that abstract thinking and um, having big ideas and sitting here and discussing them, but also the opportunity to apply them in the world. Um, because that informs um, my views and it is the sort of empirical experience that's so important. Um, it's also rewarding in the sense that to know that those ideas can be applied. Um, so if we wanted to just sit here and have a big conversation, that's nice and that can be wonderful, but it can also be wonderful to say, oh, so if we want to act on that conversation and some of those ideas we had and figure out how to implement them, um, which could be productive in a sense, but, but also would, would be in a sense perpetuating the, the, the ideas that we have. Um, I think that's valuable. So I, I think what's important is, is not to go for a, a model of one or the other, um, but to leave that space for reflection, to not turn ourselves to being productive and mobilized all the time, um, but to embrace also the opportunities to do that and to interact with the real world and to do things and to ensure, um, to help the knowledge that we do develop um, go out into the world and to be utilized and to, to uh, develop more knowledge based on that. So I think that they're not mutually exclusive, but absolutely um, it's a danger to be aware of, so, or, or an implication to be aware of. So I appreciate your pointing that out. Yeah, so it was not also meant as a kind of critique. It was just that to, to try to make uh, our point, because maybe I, I, if I may, because I don't want to, <laughs> to monopolize the, the discussion, but um, because you said, yeah, to, to, to make it practical and to make it relevant for the world. But in a certain way, that is precisely what, this, what, what is happening in the lecture hall. If, the, if what is happening in the lecture hall and in the public lecture is a kind of profanation, take the example of the, let us say, the founding act of the university, we take the text out of the monastery and we put it on the table and we can publicly discuss the text. So what you actually are doing there is deprivatizing, making it public, it is giving it back to the world. So now the words can say much more than, than the, the, the places where they were privatized. In the, 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 words can, the words are given back to the world in a certain way. So it is not like a kind of, uh, how to say, completely uh, irrelevant action to the world where we in, would be concentrated on ourselves. No, it is maybe the most worldly, in a certain sense, the most worldly activity that you have there. It's to, to bring it back to the, to the world, to, to, to deprivatize it. Like I think also the professor is not a teacher. So the professor is not speaking, for example, in the name of a discipline, not of a scientific discipline. He's speaking, and I just cite Kant, he's speaking in his own name. He can only speak in his own name. So that's precisely also this experimental aspect. So he is not privatizing, but he's making his thinking public. And in that making public, he's offering something back to the world, you could, uh, so, so you could say. So I would not make a contrast uh, uh, there too strong. But I, I agree with your, with your, with your comment, and that's not, uh, that's not my point. I just want to... Yeah, trying to specify the uniqueness of the, of the university itself as form. I, I think I almost completely agree with what you said, so, and I don't have much to add. Uh, if maybe the only thing I want to say is that uh, um, you mentioned, someone mentioned before what the university as to give the most, uh, um, I, I think one very precious good that the university has to give to the environment and the external world is independence of mind. This is what is most important, without which no scientific research, no advancement of knowledge could be reached. And of course it's very, um, now there is no recipe for uh, no easy recipe for independence of mind. I mean, one has to be um, 
it's a challenge, a continuous challenge, and this is what uh, we professors have to do. Um, keeping in mind that, yes, we are accountable, we are held accountable to the, ex in quote, external world or society at large and so on. And yet, at the same time, we are especially accountable to the norms of our own profession. So, um, the, the 1915 declaration has an interesting uh, parallel um, concerning uh, faculty and uh, um, the federal judges in the United States. Uh, the federal judges are nominated by the executive, but they're in a way independent. I mean, they have to exercise their freedom of mind uh, to the, you know, truly. That's exactly the kind of relationship uh, we should have towards society at large. I mean, we depend for both for financing, for what we have to offer, and we are uh, accountable to society at large, and yet we have to keep uh, our independence of mind. Thank you. As we um, prepare to involve you, the audience, in the discussion, the conversation, I just had one ad additional remark. When you said to take the students away from their usual spaces and occupations, uh, that's again something that has, a, has been a recurring theme because um, when yesterday John Palfrey was talking about uh, um, the environment in which uh, a famous judge would work, this famous, uh, uh, wonderful uh, study room full of books, uh, that was his place where he would uh, be most productive. Uh, it, when you say students, we want to take them away from the usual spaces and occupations, uh, again, uh, since digital technology allow us uh, uh, not to do that, the students could be in a peer-to-peer -peer university all over the world. How do we achieve in, in a virtual environment uh, uh, the equivalent uh, of saying uh, you're coming in this special place, assuming it's possible, or at least to approximate it? Now, I would like really to involve uh, uh, the audience in this conversation, and therefore I would like to switch the lights on. And uh, we have a microphone, and who would like to comment? Any comments? Yes, in the second row. I want to take further uh, where, the dis where you left the uh, concept of the text and making it public, because I think this is the crux of what's happening in the internet age, that the text is not just a different form of a text, and I don't know if the digital native who left could tell us what are the um, approaches to the multimedia interactive text in a digital world. So how will that change the, um, the com communities of students and, and professors? Another issue is um, how do we ensure, um, or maybe it's a wrong question, the experiment uh, or ex experimental approach to the text, because I think that's where another wave of changes is taking place on the internet more people seem to double or change the text, the, the whole peer approach to creating knowledge. How, how does it fit into the concept of publicly thinking about the text? Who creates the text? Um, I was commenting on it. It would be nice to, since we close to Milan, um, and many people read the name of the Rose, Umberto Eco's book, like what happens when somebody has an authority over which text should be made public and which one shouldn't. So all these questions I think remain unanswered and they will have to be answered if we think about the future of university. Yes, maybe, uh, maybe first to the, to the first question. So I think that in fact, 
so the way in which text function on the internet, addressing people as individual learners, it's just another way of privatizing. Hmm? So everybody his own learning trajectory. That is in fact what is also uh, very often said today. Everybody has his own highly individual learning needs and has to uh, cope with these needs and can go through the internet to there then find what meets uh, his needs. I don't think this is so that this is so simply putting the text on the internet is not making it public in the way that that is precisely why the why the paradigm of the lecture of the public lecture I think is important. It is gathering people as a public as a thinking public related to the same matter of concern put on the table whereby, whereby the student is precisely the one who is not the learner that means he's not the one who approaches the text from the standpoint of what can I do with it how can it be useful for me how can it satisfy my needs that's the question let's say or how can it be productive for my own life or for my own problems but the student is precisely the one who interrupts this logic the student is the one who exposes to text so, so it's that different movement it is the, not the movement from what can I do with the text but on the contrary how can the text do something with me and that I think is the attitude of the student is one who is delivered to something and and this of course, I don't say that the internet, that it is impossible, but it is the, it is the question how, how can this public gathering, so bringing a thinking public together, how can we actually, yeah, how can it work, or, or what do we have to do, uh, or how, how do we have to organize it, or can, can, we, can we do that, how can we do that? That is precisely for me, or for us, is that, that is a it's really a cha challenge. But simply putting things on the internet, I think, is not making things public. I don't say that it's not important. That's another thing. But uh, I, I certainly, uh, um, yeah, I, I certainly agree that making knowledge um, uh, available is very, very important. And maybe, maybe there is also a task there for the university in the sense that. Um, uh, Maybe if I may, I, I, I want to recall that the invention of the school, not of the university, the invention of the school was actually also bringing knowledge from the, uh, the place where they were um, yeah, related to a privileged position of those who were near to the power. In a certain way, the, what, what is the invention of the school is to bring the knowledge out of this privileged place into a kind of public place. And maybe you could say that today, an important thing is to, uh, uh, but I'm not a specialist in this kind of thing, but what, what, uh, what I see is that the, the knowledge which is today very important, or seems to be important, is the knowledge which is related to the internet and to the use of the computers, is, this, is, this, is the software and the pro programming. I think that there is a that there is indeed also there a task for the university to make this to make this public and you see all kinds of movements and that relates maybe to, to your question of the funding you see all right all kinds of movement at universities to privatize knowledge at our universities professors when they want in the in the sciences and computer sciences or you know, if they want to make promotion it is more important for them to have uh, Patents, 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 so that means privatization of knowledge than publication. So if they can privatize the knowledge, then they, they, get, they get promotion. So that's a, just to make the point about this, making public can sometimes be in itself also an, an important thing. But that is still not, I think, what is happening in the, or not only what is happening in the public lecture, it's also part of it, but that's not the essential, the essential Second question. Uh, uh, the peer to peer production of text. Uh, we don't know who's the author, for instance, of the text. 
like in the case of Wikipedia, it's a collective, uh, a collective text. Uh, oh yeah, the, the, the working, the working on the, the working on the on the text, the, the, the creation. That was the second question was about the creation, the common creation of a text. Yeah, I, I think there can be, there are possibilities certainly there, but the, but again, I think it is. It is important out of which, which kind of attitude you could say that this is done. Huh? So I, I try to make this difference between this experimental attitude or this attitude of exposition. And the other attitude you could say is a productive attitude or is an attitude where you are submitting yourself uh, to a kind of, um, for example, economic laws or whatever, or the quality laws or whatever. So, so the experimental ethos is a, is a different, and maybe maybe it, it can be related. So I'm I'm uh, I don't want to uh, certainly certainly we don't want to to say the internet is a bad thing or something no. like that. But it's it, it's a challenge, but it's a real challenge. Yes, it's. A Okay, thank you. Uh, I agree totally with what you are uh, thinking about uh, reading and uh, coming back to the Middle Ages, if I can uh, understand what you are saying. But we are not uh, the Middle Ages, and now we are uh, facing uh, uh, mass education at the university. And I don't know how it's possible to reconcile uh, mass education and, uh, and this type of relationship uh, with, uh, with a special audience and so on. Of course, it's, it's wonderful. It's, I think we, but I, I cannot, uh, you know, I'm, I have a pragmatist attitude, I'm sorry, but how it's possible to reconciliate uh, your exigence with uh, mass education? And I'm afraid it's not uh, university, I, I am, maybe you, you are uh, promoting uh, 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 excellence university, as we said in France, maybe only 10 universities in a country would be like that, and, and the other would be normal university. With, so just a question of, uh, about mass education and this type of methodology. Um, um, <clears throat> I don't think, I think, you, Okay, we, we use this idea of the public lecturing as a kind of paradigm, which, and I don't think it has, I'm not sure whether that is impossible to implement in a mass university or let's say in a mass higher education system. I mean, I don't think numbers uh, do count here, and I think at that level, I think the internet, or let's say, public virtual learning communities can play an important role. But again, I think it's important then first to try to organize such a community that it becomes a kind of yeah, university-oriented or let's say university-based learning community. And I think that's not an opposite with, I mean, I don't think it's, it's impossible to combine it with, with a big group, so to speak. I don't think you need an elite university to implement this idea of an experimental ethos. I think you can organize it at a large scale. But it has, for me, it has, first of all, it has to do with finding, of organizing time and space, using or developing infrastructure and methods in order to bring, in a way, people together around issues. What do you think Jan was talking about? Maybe, maybe if I can, uh, if I can add. It. So uh, I understand your question. That's also that's a very real question. That's our real question. But it was precisely when we were tackling the, this this question, which we also sent it to you. What are universities for? What makes universities in universities? And the story we often hear is: it, universities are the combination of research, teaching, teaching, and service. Yeah? And so it is the function, the, fun, the, the fact that the university combines these three functions. Yes. When this is the case, then the university is damned to die. Because, in a, uh, because each of these functions can today much more better be performed by institute, research institutions, teaching institutions, and actually it is what is happening. We, have, we, we get so-called research universities and so on. So we, we get the splitting, we, we split simply the functions and they can well, much better be performed by 
separate uh, institutions which take uh, uh, each of these functions for themselves. So our, our initial question is what makes university into university? And so th that is in fact what we try to say here is where we are. So it is not like now we have a solution, but for us this offers us an opportunity to think about and now let's, make, let's try to make that very concrete, that very pragmatic. So what is it now to design a public university if you take into account the actual conditions? But, but at least we have, we have the feeling that we have some idea of what the university, what the university is, is about. Uh, so that is the, the point. So I don't want to, 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 to say that it is not an important question. On the contrary, I think it's a very important question. But it's a real question. So. I should like to add a perspective which does not contradict anything that the people in the panel said, that I, but that I was missing uh, when considering the new situation that is faced, that the universities are facing today. At the time when I studied in the 70s, universities were concerned with the accumulation of knowledge. And to put it a little bit provocatively, I would say their new job will be the deleting or the destruction of knowledge because Today we have a situation like as if every telephone conversation was publicly accessible and we certainly don't need more accumulation of knowledge but we need techniques of filtering this knowledge and distinguishing the relevant from the non-relevant or as the inventor of information theory put it uh, Shannon, uh, distinguish, distinguish between uh, signal and noise. And uh, it may be an important consideration that the only ICT information that uses a non-compressible amount of energy is the deleting of a bit. And maybe the function of libraries in the future will not be to preserve every possible publication but actually to decide which of all the unimportant publications to uh, abolish in order to give pointers to the public where you find the important information. Okay, let's, let's take another two questions and then we conclude over there and over there. And, and then. Um, you mentioned earlier, a bit earlier, about the function of the university. And um, I want to, to put this question, are universities still capable of assuming the role of content creators and also disseminators of knowledge? Don't, and uh, speaking on the time scale, are professors capable of managing these two important functions anymore? Because they are entangled with all so many other parallel actions like managing, like uh, project coordination, like all these sorts of little pastoring uh, activities. So are they still capable of managing the both functions of knowledge creators and disseminators also in a good and orderly fashion way? And uh, over there, let's take the last question. Thank you. Uh, it's very stimulating to hear how you frame, you know, the university around, around the public lecture model. But I think that there are two different things in what you're saying, and it very much relates to two of the questions that were already, uh, or comments made before. One aspect is about the knowledge and whether it's public and private, and sometimes, you know, you will say that um, patents, you know, will mean it's privatized or... and. It was a very interesting point that you made that being public and being on the internet can be a very different thing. The other aspect which you know, uses a different way of um, understanding the public is to say that the public lectures, for example, is something that would be more, let's say, conducive to public deliberation. Uh, that would be something which would be shared. Um, and what's interesting is that the first aspect can be 
very easily related to the internet. You know, you can put stuff and make them more accessible. When you say that it's more about, you know, being in a shared audience, creating a collective, that's something which is very much more difficult to replicate uh, on the internet. And I think that it's really, and if we link it to mass education, of course, posting a lot of stuff so that people can access it, if it's just whether the knowledge is public or private, that very much relates. If you want to create a setting where you can create something public, that's much more difficult to, to achieve. And I think that it's very relevant to our discussion because uh, if we think of why, for example, all the virtual universities didn't work so much at the beginning of the year 2000, etc., uh, one of the explanations, and which was put forward by John C. Brown, was that the university is a community of scholars, and because of that, people uh, want to be part of a social network, basically, and it's very difficult to replicate, especially at that time, it was very difficult to replicate on the internet. Now, with all the new social tools, maybe it's uh, easier, but it's difficult to think how this can really be done at uh, mass level, as was mentioned before. So, just a comment. Um, Thank you. Do you want to react to some of the... <coughs> <laughs> Just perhaps about, uh, is it possible still to combine two tasks, knowledge production and knowledge dissemination? Um, of course, I think also at our university, a lot of universities, there is tension, but I think somehow we, we should also try to reverse the question, what does it mean to be a professor? And isn't, if we try to define what it is to be a professor, isn't there a kind of intrinsic link between doing research and teaching? And if that's the case, then the question is, should we keep on to that tradition, so to speak, or true, do we have to find ways to enable people to, in a way, to, to do research and teaching? And I think, again, we should try to answer the question, indeed, what is a university, but also what is a professor, or what makes a professor a professor, and not immediately try to answer the, the or to try to stick to the practical question whether it's possible to combine, and if it's not possible to combine, let's uh, skip one task. So, again, it's a bit in line with what was Jan was saying, perhaps we should try to ask the question again, what makes a professor a professor? And according to me, the, there is a kind of intrinsic relation between doing research and presenting research during a public lecture or another way of it. There are other ways of presenting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful discussion. Thank you for coming all the way to Torino. Thank you. We'll be back at 2.15 after lunch. <laughs>